welcome to another edition of our Theory Lunch. Today we're very happy to have our very own Venka Gurswami here to talk to us about hashing. Uh, Venka's done lots of great work in coding theory and harvest approximation and lots of other fields. So. Thanks, Nick, and thanks to all for coming. Uh, yeah, so today I'll, I'll talk about uh, a result in combinatorics, which is inspired by two directions in computer science. One is perfect hashing. Uh, the other one is uh, a coding problem related to this decoding. So, and uh, everything I say should be very elementary and simple, so please stop me if something is not clear. And depending on how we go, we might do most of the proof or some fraction thereof. It's, it's certainly an elementary proof. Okay, so I'll start with something uh, very basic. Suppose you have n objects, and uh, suppose you want to distinguish them. So you want to label them uh, by, uh, distinguish them by labeling with binary sequences or 0, 1 sequences. Okay, so how short a label can you have or how short can that sequence be? Well, of course, that's just ceiling of log 2n. So you can index into a n element universe with, with a log, log 2n based string. And of course, you cannot do better than this. So okay, that's pretty trivial. That's our basic binary encoding. So that is for distinguishing, but what about for a new word, distinguishing, <laughs> so, uh, which is uh, actually a word which uh, Janos Korner uses, and this is one of his favorite problems, which he called preferences problem. But it's the same thing. So you have n objects, but now you want to n label them by ternary sequences. So label by uh, ternary sequences. Let's say those in 1, 2, 3, 2, n. And you would like the property that for any triple, you can distinguish them um, by at least one. So that's where the, so what does it mean to distinguish them for, uh, for all x, y, z in your universe. So let's say universe of n objects. So there must be, uh, there exists an i for which x, i, y, i, z, i are all distinct. So if, the, if you take a triple of objects, there must be some attribute where they're all different. Okay? And then the question, of course, is how small can n be? Okay? So, so that's the, the, the distinguishing problem. And I'm going to actually just state it in the sort of the converse way, which is that, so we desire a code. So there are some connections to coding theory, so let me call it a code, but for the purposes of this talk, this is just simply a subset of 1, 2, 3 to the n. Um, when you say i, y, i, z, i, think you mean that all three of them? All three of them occur, yeah. That would be different for each one, okay. No, no, so there exists a single i for yeah. which uh, all the three have to be different. Okay. So the set x, i, y, i, z, i must be 1, 2, 3 in some order. Okay. So again, let me say it in the way uh, uh, the, the way I want it. So let's say so such a code is let's say a code is a three hash code, and again I'll make the connection to hashing apparent in the second. So uh, so define. So you take a subset of ternary strings and you call it a three hash code. If basically this property happens, if for all x, y, z in C distinct, if you take any distinct triple. There exists an i for which x i, y i, z i, and let me make it very clear. This it's basically the set. So another way to pictorially is if we have x y z, so you can take any triple in the set. There must be some coordinate where all the three values are. Okay, so that's the distinguishing problem. It's why what do I call it a three hash code, or why is it related to hashing? Because basically, you can think about such a code as giving a family of n hash functions. So you can define n hash functions h1, hn, from the code to 1, 2, 3, in the obvious way, where the ith hash function will simply map the string to its ith coordinate. Okay, so hix is defined to be x sub. And now this family of functions is a perfect hash family because if you take any triple in your universe, the u became now a c. So, so if you take any triple in the universe, there is some 
function which hashes them perfectly. Namely, they are all distinct. Okay, so this distinguishing question then is basically what's the minimum size of a perfect hash family into domain size 1, 2, 3. Okay, but uh, so, so what we are interested in is that suppose you want this property, so we'll ask the, instead of asking how few n you can pick, how few number of hash functions you can pick, let me just ask how large can such a, can such a three hash code be. Again, this three hash code is just terminology I'm introducing for this talk. The asymptotic. That's something I guess was supposed to have been obvious is that yeah. this code has that property for two, right? For two, yes. So yeah, good. You thanks. Didn't say that, so but this I guess is, yeah. So the, the way I went from distinguishing to distinguishing just is because, because yeah. in the binary string yeah. case, if they're going to be different, they have to differ on some order. Right. And then, uh, and of course, there we know the answer. Capital N is 2 to the N up to floor okay, and ceiling. Time to figure that out. Okay. <laughs> so, but this is the big question. So here I'm asking, fixing little n, but I'm really thinking of, uh, by asymptotically, I'm thinking of n going to infinity. Little n going to infinity. And I would like to know how big can such a code be. Okay. And in particular, it's, it, that, that code is going to grow. The size of the code will grow like 2 to the... Basically, it's going to grow like some number 2 to the rn. So it will be exponential in n. And the question is, what is the best r you can put here? So that's the question. OK, so this is not the question we make any progress on, sadly, because this is a very well known, one of the most basic unsolved problems in perfect hashing is, what's the best thing known? I'll tell you what bounds are known, but nobody knows the answer to this question. OK, distinguishing is trivial. Distinguishing is a long-standing open problem. Okay, again, if, so again, just work with this definition. So now I have a subset of, and again, I'm going to make this 3, 4 for the bulk of the talk, but this is the most basic case. I want ternary sequences of length n. How many can I pick such that for every triple, there is a distinguishing or a distinguishing coordinate? Okay, so that's the question. So what's known? Um, so, there ex so it's known, so there are two things which are known about this problem. So again, this is not a problem on which we make progress sadly. So we make progress on the case when the 3 is replaced by 4. So uh, the alphabet becomes 4, but 3 is the hardest case. But it's, it's really good to set the context. So there exists a 3 hash code, C, with size of C is at least about 2 point. I'm not, I think this is the best known, but nobody has really tried to improve this. And that could be like a good little uh, project to try to get the best bounds. So we know you can have exponentially many sequences. Okay. And for all three hash code, C, size of C is at most two times three halves to the end. So shouldn't the inequality in the first one be the other way? It is an upper bound? Right? So here I'm saying that there is a code which is big. Here I'm saying no code can be big. What is that number in the actual? Two point, uh, two to the point two one two. And this I believe works out to exponent as two to the, well I myself can't read this, but something like 0.54. So the first one is a product of the product. Yeah. The first one is a, basically a random construction. If you just do completely random. OK, so please, yeah, again, I think I messed up some notations. Little n is the length of the sequence. You want to maximize the size of the set. OK, and the first result says that you can pick a reasonably large set, something like 2 to the 2.212. And that's a non-constructive thing. You pick a random sequence. But you are slightly more clever than that. If you just pick a completely random sequence, random subset from this, you will get slightly weaker bounds. By being slightly clever, this is known. Something even better might be known. Uh, so this is, by the way, corner Martin. 88, but it's really an observation in the paper. The paper, the more interesting line of work is this, upper bounds, because you want to prove that no code can be very big. Is there any exponential constructive bound? Uh, there probably should be, yeah, but just by taking insights from coding and stuff. So again, this is an existential result. This talk, I'm not worried about uh, constructions. In fact, I'm not even worried about lower bounds. I'm worried about upper bounds. Again, upper bounds are negative results here, because you're doing an upper bound on the size of the codes. Maybe it's, that may be slightly confusing. 
But these are hashed in the usual sense that they're oblivious, or? Yeah, so these are just, uh, yeah, so you index your universe into the C in some way. And uh, you have a family of n hash functions, such that for every triple, one hash function will send them to distinct places. Any other questions? So one thing I'll do is, uh, I'll do, I don't know if I'll get to the actual proof we do, but I'll do some proofs on the way. In particular, let me prove them. And that will also help because, so one thing is that I, I would have shown you something, some proof, which is good. Uh, and I think it will help you uh, remove any of the remnant confusion about the question. And stuff. So again, what I want to prove is that if you take any three hash code, you cannot make it bigger than 3 halves to the n. Ignore this 2. So it's asymptotically, it can only grow as 3 halves to the n. Trivial upper bound is, of course, 3 to the n, because it's a ternary sequence. And you get 3 halves to the n. OK. So this proof is really two liners if I, uh, if I do it properly. So let's see how we're going to do this. Uh, OK. Pick. So again, it's a cute. It's a proof by the first moment method, for those who know that uh, terminology. So basically what I'm going to do is that I'm going to pick a random R at random, let's say uniformly at random. I'm going to take an R, R1 through Rn at random. Now let me do fix some element x in C. Fix a fixed, you know, C is an arbitrary three hash code. Take one of its elements. What's the probability that xi is different from ri for every i. Again, r is a random sequence, x is a fixed sequence. What's the chance the fixed sequence differs from the random sequence in every coordinate? Two thirds to the n. Two thirds to the n. Okay, so now you see why. So that's this. So let me, hopefully, people can see. Let me try to finish the proof here. Yeah. So because of this, you can ask, what is the expected number of elements of C that differ from R in every coordinate? Okay, good old linearity of expectation. Each point differs from R in every coordinate with this probability. So the expectation is exactly equal to the size of C times 2 thirds here. On the other hand, what is the definition of a three hash code? It says that any triple will have some coordinate where they're all different. In particular, you cannot have three elements which are all in every coordinate different from Ri. Right? So, so this expectation can be at most two. Again, let me repeat that because uh, if it was more than two, so then there must be some by just probabilistic method, there must be some triple which differs from R in every coordinate. But then in that coordinate, that triple can have only have two values because it cannot take the value Ri. Okay, so this expectation can be at most two. On the other hand, it's exactly this quantity, so rearrange case. Okay, one line argument, that's the best upper bound. So if you improve this upper bound, I think uh, in some circles you'll be quite famous. And I think it's by, by now recognized as a very annoying problem that we cannot improve. Okay, so this is the setting. Uh, Even the two is the best one. Oh, so that I didn't, again, okay. probably you can be clever and push this two down to one or something, but the exponent, nothing better. So, okay, we need an eraser. Alright, so there is one more context for this problem which comes from coding, but I might actually skip that context because I think uh, hopefully hashing is a good enough context uh, for this, but I'll just write this down. Um, so I'll just mention why this problem is also interesting to information theorists. So Janos Korner and others who have studied this are all information theorists, so why do they care? So here is a, so I'll just throw this out there, but I won't justify things, but it's not hard, it's just chasing definitions. So you can have the following channel where you input one of three possibilities and the output will be, I mean you can do it various ways, but let me do it this way, so it's maybe the 
So when you send a symbol i, it can be received as i or i plus 1 mod 3. Okay, so this is 1, 2. So this graph basically means that when you send a 1, it can be received as 1 or 2. When you send a 2, it can be received as 2 or 3. When you send a 3, it can be received as 2. Okay, so this channel as such has a capacity of 0. Any two symbols can be confused, so you cannot communicate anything on this channel. But, uh, so this 3 hash problem code is basically equivalent to a code that enables list of 2 decode. Okay, so I won't elaborate further on this, but there is a relaxation of decoding where you don't expect to get a unique answer, but let's say you allow two possible answers, one of which is guaranteed to be correct. Then on this channel, you can communicate at positive rate, and the best rate at which you can communicate is exactly the optimal R you can have for a three hash code. And again, that's just definition chasing. There's nothing novel about the connection. It's just the problem which also arises in other networks. Okay. Okay, that's all the preamble for the most interesting case. Yeah. One more, one more time. Okay. So. So, so this thing here, right? So this is a you, you introduce a certain noisy channel, right? Yeah, it's it's a, it's a channel which is when you send a symbol, it can it can be transmitted as either that symbol or that symbol plus one. You don't control which. Okay. And then you would like to push data through reliably on this channel. Okay, good. And for this channel, that's impossible if you always want to get a unique answer. But if you allow yourself to output two answers for if the message you sent, one of which is guaranteed to be correct, then communication becomes possible. And the most efficient way to communicate exactly happens to use, is basically to use a three hash code. So when you use this channel n times, you don't send arbitrary sequences of length n. So you if only I pick a one, then I would say it's either a one or a three. Uh, no, but even those would be confused, right? Because a one or every pair of symbols are confusable. So that would be, but that's the answer. So I would say yeah, I can yeah. use either one or a three. Yeah. Oh, well, that is for length one. Okay. But now I, I would like to use this channel n times, where n goes to infinity, that little n. And then I should pick a ternary sequence such that in the end you can decode it to two possible terms. But, but not back to back. You don't keep doing this over and no. over. No. So if you do that, your rate will be very bad. Yeah. So. So you're going to just send, you're going to apply this thing to every, every uh, triple. Yeah, you have to do send. something aggregate. Because if you do, for example, what you said, suppose you, you decide to send 1 or 3, and also 1 or 3 in the second coordinate. Uh -huh. Then when you receive 1 and 1, all four possibilities become possible. Because it could have been a 1, 1, 1, 3, 3, 1, or a 3, 3. And I don't want that. So you want to, out, you want to input to that channel one of the elements of your set. Of C, C, exactly. Yeah. And you, Type it through trit by trit, yeah. distorting it in that way, yeah. it outputs, and you want to compute two things which could have yeah. at the end. Which are consistent which, with what you see. Yeah. One of which is guaranteed to be correct. Correct one, yeah. Okay. So and that's and, if you and that's possible because of the, the fact perfect that perfect. So basically the coordinate. So why can you tell these, okay, I guess people want the connection, so I'll tell this thing. So why can you pin it down to two possibilities? If you only transmitted sequences from a three hash code, if I take any three code words, there will be some coordinate where they are all, all possibilities will occur. And in that coordinate, you would have got only one of the three possible values and that, that will rule out one of those three candidates. Okay, I mean, it's really just reformulation. No. Okay, so. If that wasn't clear, don't worry about it. But this is the reason information theorists care about this. It's called uh, zero error capacity. goes back to Shannon and then Lovash's famous work for Shannon capacity in the non-list decoding sense. So there's a rich uh, body. OK, so this is all for the ternary case where life is pretty bad in the sense that we have a trivial upper bound and nobody has managed to improve it. Life is better when. Uh, Things are better when you make three bigger. So what about a k hat? Okay. So so it's again the same problem. Whatever I said with three, replace it with k. Okay. For every yeah. Does that include the three in distinguishing? Or are we still trying to distinguish? Or no, no. Yeah, that's good. So, so now we are trying to, uh, I guess, k distinguish or something like this. But let me just say what a k code is for all z1. Z2, ZK in the code, there must be an I for which the set Z1I to ZKI is exactly the full set. 
I mean, there are other settings of this too, where you can ask for every triple, there is a coordinate where they're all distinct and so on, but this is the setting I'm most interested. Okay, so literally you just, uh, so there must be a coordinate for any k-tuple of code words, there is a coordinate where they're all distinct. Okay. All right, so what's known about this? Uh, so with this, there is, uh, actually, I, again, there's a trivial upper bound we can do. So for all k hash code, verbatim the same proof will, I believe, give k minus 1. I mean, you can just do the substitution. So you can get this one. So this is the same first moment method. Pick a random sequence and do this argument. And uh, from now on, I'm not going to be so interested in what can, what kind of codes exist. I'm going to be more interested <coughs> in this upper bound. So how do you rule out there is no good perfect hash code? Okay, so, so the same proof will give you this, but something much better is known. So what's the better thing known? And I'll probably sketch some aspect of it. Um, so what is known is that the size of the code. So although you have more symbols to work with, yeah. you can't, it's, it's weaker. You can't send it that, much information. Yeah, right. Because you want to have all k values. Yeah. So it's a bit counter, yeah. It's a bit weaker because, as Danny says, if you think of k growing, this rate is going to be more like 1 over k. Because yeah. we take lo you know, logs and stuff like that. But, uh, but actually, so yeah, so this will basically, let me just write that down. Uh, so this will roughly say for k large, uh, that this is something like 1 over k. Okay, for large k. So in particular, for uh, k large, the rate sort of goes to. Zero. Again, the way I want to think about this is that I fix k and then let n go to infinity, but then I can also sort of study what happens when k is But what is also known is, so this is a classic result. Uh, so this is Fredman Komlosh from 84. And why is this better than that? Just by Sterling's approximation, this is something like e to the minus k. So this is like exponentially smaller than k. Okay. And that's pretty close to the lower bound as well, though I don't want to really talk about the lower bound. Um, so for the talk, now I want to really, the place where we get an improvement. And so this is still the best known upper bound for k greater or equal to 5. In fact, maybe because people really didn't try to think about it too much, it's quite likely the techniques we have will give some improvement for K5 and so on. Also, we, we haven't just worked it out yet. Okay, so now for the rest of the talk, I guess I'll get to the actual part, which I think so that's the thing with these board talks. It takes a long time to set the context, but maybe it's actually good people can understand. It. So we'll focus on case. Okay, so, so the rest of the talk k is 4. So for every 4 tuple of code words, you want a coordinate, but they're all this. Okay, so, so in this case, the fredman komlosh bound will actually say, so again, what I'm going to be interested in is what's log 2c. Okay, I should also put a by n here. So the rate. <laughs> is at most about 3 eighths plus some little over one. So I'll again, I'll, for simplicity, I'll ignore that, but usually these things will have a little over one. So why 3 8? Because you just put k as 4 there, you get 24 by 64, which is 3 8. And I'll try to hint at where you get this 3 8 as well. And just for, in this case, let me just say random coding um, shows there exists a 4 hash code uh, of rate about 0 0.04 something, 7. Okay, and this is of course 0.375. So there's quite a bit of a gap between the lower and the upper bound. But in this case, fortunately, there was already an improvement. So this was 84. And there was some follow-up work by Corner and Martin who replaced some graph theoretic tools with hypergraph tools to improve the bounds, but they didn't get any improvement for this particular problem. 
So the improvement for this problem came by Arikan, the same one of the polar coding frame, if you have heard about those codes, where he proved that the rate, so he basically improved the upper bound to be 0.3512. And again, this was not any nice number, it was based on some optimization. Okay, so at least I'll state our, our main and only result in this paper, which is really an improvement. And I think more than the specific numbers, I think we shed some light on these proofs. Basically, there were these two proofs, and we combined some insights from both of these to get an improvement. <coughs> so, so our theorem, uh, four hash code C, subset of one, two, three, four to the n, satisfies size of C is at most two to the 6n by 19. All right. So in, in other words, the rate is at most 6 by 19, which is about 0.315. Okay, so that's our Any questions about the context? So at least the result statement should be clear. Okay, so we basically just. I'm confused. Yeah. It seems like you should be getting a number between uh, 0.35 and 3. No, no, so this is also an upper bound. That's an okay, improvement. Good. This is an improvement of this bound, which we further improve. Okay, good. And of course, these are all, it's not at all clear these are close to the truth. Probably we'll never find out the truth. See, it took him 10 years to go from 375 yeah, to 351. Yeah. It took him 10, 15, 20 more years. Yeah, but. So that's good because you went, you have a bigger jump. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I should also, to be fair to Arikan, um, so I'll come to this. You can improve Arikan's bound um, to somewhere in between these two things with much less work. Basically, we can take his proof and hit it with more modern technology more some modern piece, and that will automatically improve the thing. So the point is really just the combination of things. Yeah, and the proof is not hard. It's not something which had to wait 20 years for any particular reason. So people looking at it. OK. So now I'll tell you the high level approach. So how will people prove these things? Um, Uh, which is based on graph covering. Okay, so what's the graph covering? So again, this is a self-contained combinatorial tool I'm going to introduce here, and then I will say how that enters into the picture in bounding the size of four hats. Again, from now on, I only care about four hats. Okay, so what's co graph covering thing? So here is a fact you might probably all be familiar with. Uh, suppose uh, suppose you take the okay. Let me ask this question. So, how many bipartite graphs are needed to cover the edges of the complete graph on n vertices? I love the yeah, you can pick any set of bipartite graphs. Every graph you pick should be bipartite. It can have isolated vertices, you know, not an induced subgraph and stuff. Graph should be bipartite, and it should cover all the edges. Answer. So this is closely related to the chromatic number of the graph and stuff. So in fact, in, in general, for any graph, the number of bipartite graphs needed to cover it is exactly the log of the, the chromatic number, of, you know, ceiling the flow. So this answer is log 2. Okay. And why is that? Okay, it's it's pretty easy to see this is the best thing, but let me at least show tell you why you can do this. Well, you can index the n vertices by log 2 n bit strings, and for every bit string, you can take the zero side and the one side. That's the bipartite graph, and obviously every edge will differ in at least one point. Okay, so this is why uh, is that, okay. So here is the generalization of that. It's easy to do it by the bottom factor also, anyway. Yeah, yeah, so there are various uh, and you can prove this is a lower bound also for by the same 
another one, another way to do lower bound is that the chromatic number of this is like n, but when you sort of union uh, two graphs and the chromatic number of bipartite graph is two, and when you take a union of two graphs, the chromatic number at most multiplies. So you need log n things to get this thing. Okay, that's basically it. Okay, but there's a generalization of this called Hansel's lemma. So let h1, h2, ht be bipartite graphs that cover kn. So this fact basically said that the best t you can have is log n. But actually you can say more and let uh, tau i be the fraction of non-isolated vertices. in HI. So each of these bipartite graphs is bipartite, but it might have some isolated vertices. So in particular, you could choose to cover each edge by just a single edge. You will take n choose two bipartite uh, graphs, but then in each one of them, you will only have like one, two non isolated So then the summation of tau i, so let me actually call it tau of i, subscript for a pain, i going from 1 to t, is at least small. Okay, so this is Hansel's lemma from 1964. And again, if people want to see the proof, I can give the proof in a few minutes, but we can also assume it and move on. And why does this imply that? Well, certainly tau i is at most 1. So this left hand side is at most t. So this basically says you need at least log n by part graphs to cover all the edges. But in fact, if you're not using the full ability of each bipartite graph and you have some isolated vertices, then you'll actually need more. Which might seem like a bizarre thing, why do I state it this way? But when I talk about the application of how it's used for the hashing problem, it's a big deal. Okay, so any questions about this? I mean, I would do the proof, but I think I probably should finish in another 10, 15 minutes, so it may be better in spent in another time. How many people want to see a proof? No, afterwards. afterwards. I mean, it's again a two-liner, but it's a slick proof. So this proof is the kind of proof which, there is a one-line proof which makes you smile because it's, it's <laughs> clever. And it's not my proof, so I can say it's clever. After we decide to move on, yeah. <laughs> Now, as I'm erasing the thing, making use of time. Over time. All right, so now why, why does this lemma really help? So let's C be a four hash code. So now I'm, the last 10, 15 minutes, I'll give you some idea about, oh, I shouldn't have erased this thing, so I had the Fredman, Komlos, and Arikan, but the bounds are not important. I'll say how both proofs, and in, in fact, our proof all have the same common structure of using graph covering, okay? So how does that come up? So what we can do is that let's take x not equal to x prime in C. Okay, so fix any two code words in C which are distinct, okay? So now we know, uh, so what do we know? So we know that for, you can have now a graph G x x prime on the B complete graph on remaining code words. Okay. So now the way graph covering is going to come is that so I've taken x and x prime, they are sitting out here. Now all the other code words are in here. Now, if I take any pair of code words y and z, which are not x and x prime, this quadruple x, x prime, y, and z must have some coordinates where they are all distinct. So, what I'm going to do is that, so let's call the coordinate some L. So, I'm going to define a bipartite graph on this, on the remaining vertices, such that the, by virtue of being a four hash code, those bipartite graphs must cover this complete graph. So, this is a complete graph. Okay. So let me define this bipartite graph h x x prime sub L to be those pairs y and z and everything is undirected graphs y and z here such that on the L coordinate they are distinguished from x and x prime such that x L x prime L y L z L is the full set. Right? And it's not hard to see that this graph is 
in fact, a bipartite stick. Okay, so it's a bipartite graph. And now comes the, the key point, which is the basis of all these proofs, is that the union of these graphs is this complete graph. Okay, so let's pass here because this is important. And this union is over all the coordinates L going from 1 to n. So I can define this for each coordinate L1, 2 to n. I claim that if I take the union of these graphs, namely the union of the edges, all the graphs are on the same vertex set, but they may have some isolated vertices and so on. But if I union them, I should cover everybody. Okay, so why is that? Because if I take an arbitrary y and z, there must be an L for which this happens. And that edge, yz, will be covered by that bipartite. And, and Gary asked why is that bipartite. I wouldn't ask that question. But. <laughs> yeah. So why is it uh, bipartite? Uh, well, there are two ways to see it. If x, x and x prime agree on a coordinate, then this graph is in fact empty. Right? So let's actually see that that's useful to see why isolated vertices come in. See, I'm picking arbitrary x and x prime. So there are going to be some coordinates where they agree. So if the first coordinate x and x prime agree, the first bipartite graph is empty because you can't get four things. Right? On the other hand, so and that's of course trivially bipartite, but if x and x prime are different, say one and two in a coordinate, and basically the y and z must only have three or four, you can put three on one side, four on the other side. Right? So these are all bipartite. Good. So you have this, and then the situation is ripe for uh, applying uh, Hansel's law. Right? So now you, so this is how graph covering comes up. So now you can define, so let me define this quantity tau x x prime L to be the fraction of non-isolated nodes or vertices in this graph HL, in this L bipartite graph. And by Hansel's lemma, By Hansen's lemma, we know that summation tau x x prime L over all L, 1 going to L, is at least log 2 to the size of C. Well, technically C minus 2, but okay, so it's, it's not going to make a difference. Why is this good? Because you wanted an upper bound on size of C. So if I can somehow upper bound tau x x prime L, the sum, then I'll be Okay, so this is the strategy for all the three proofs. Uh, Fredman, Komlosh, Arikan, and us. Okay. So what did Fredman, Komlosh do? So then there are two games here, right? So, so, so really the key thing is how do you pick this x and x prime? So on the one hand, picking x and x prime to agree on a lot of coordinates is a good thing. Because whenever x and x prime agree on a coordinate, that corresponding tau is zero. So you're getting a better upper bound because you want to upper bound this left hand side. Okay, so you would like to say this is at most. So what Arikan did, and that's where coding theory also comes up, is that he said in any large code, there must be two code words which agree on many coordinates. So there are many bounds in coding theory like that. He used a particularly simple one. He picked x and x prime to agree on a lot of coordinates. Those coordinates completely go out of play. But in the remaining coordinates, he was not very careful I mean, he was losing something. Okay, but let me first say what Fredman Komlosh did, which is perhaps a very simple thing you can do, which is pick x and x prime at random. And again, obviously, for you, know, you have to do it without replacement. But C is a big enough guy that let's just pretend you do it with replacement. Okay, it's going to not change anything. And. Uh, and now you can basically say that now I can take expectations on this, right? So let me now call these guys capital X and X prime because these are random variables. So by virtue of the same thing, the summation expectation tau X X prime L is at least log 2C. Okay, let me forget the minus 2. Okay, and now let me also do this thing where I, yeah, let me take the expectation in which I'm allowed to do. So I have this. Okay, so Fredman Komlos said, let's pick these two code words at random, and that somehow simultaneously address. Okay, so what are these two things you want, right? So if x and x prime agree on a coordinate, great. 
the corresponding tau is 0. On the other hand, if they disagree, you would like them to eat up the most frequent value in that coordinate. Say the first coordinate, you have four possibilities, 1, 2, 3, 4, and say 1 and 2 are more popular. When you pick x randomly, x and x prime are going to pick that more popular values. And that's good because in this bipartite graph, the remaining y and z must have the less frequent values, and only those will be non-isolated. So somehow this random choice kind of takes everything into account in a very nice way. Okay, so, so the key thing then he, he can prove, so this is the definition, so here is a lemma, so I won't prove it, but um, I will justify it by just saying that the worst case is when everything is equal, which you will believe. So for every L, this quantity is at most 3 A's. So clearly this L doesn't play a role here because all coordinates are symmetric. So and what you can prove is that this expected quantity is at most 3 8's. Therefore this whole thing is 3 N by 8 and that's your Fredman combination. Alright? And, uh, and why is this quantity 3 8's? So let me at least say that. Are you using any property or then there's just an arbitrary set of numbers? Or? No, nothing. Yeah. This is something called muir hitz inequality or something in combinatorics. But I'll actually say exactly what it is. Right? So, so really, the expectation can be written exactly like this. And again, when you fix a particular L, you're basically just picking a random pair, A and B. Okay? So this expectation, again, it's a single dimensional object. You're basically picking two, uh, two things. So let me actually just, again, this is the kind of thing where if I just write down what it is, it will be very clear. So what let's do is let's take the lth coordinate. And the code words have some frequencies. A, uh, actually, let me call it F1, F2, F3, F4, to be the frequencies of 1, 2, 3, 4 in that coordinate. Then what is this quantity? It's basically just the following, i not equal to j, fi, and fj. To be non-isolated, you better pick i and j. This i and j are what the values which x and x prime take. Okay, So maybe I should use a and b, because i and j will be confused for indices. Okay. So this is the probability x has a, x prime has b, and they are different. And now, what's the probability that the remaining graph, y and z, is non-isolated? It must have one of the two other values, which is this. And that's it. And you can prove that for any, and where f, f1 plus f2 plus f3 plus f4 is, of course, 1. It's a frequency. And you can, it's not hard to prove that this quantity is maximized when all the fi's are equal. In which case it is one fourth times one fourth times one half, and how many pairs you sum up? It's you know ordered pairs, so twelve pairs. So twelve times the quantity is three. Right? So that's, that's what Fredman comes. Okay, and that's basically a complete proof. Modulo justifying this inequality, and obviously we pulled up this Hansel lemma for covering complete graphs work. <coughs> Okay, so when should I finish by? Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, good. So now, any questions this about this? From, uh, from the original paper by Fred? Yeah, this is from the, their argument. Yeah. Oh, this is their argument. Yeah. And what Arikan did was rather than pick x and x prime at random, he picked x and x prime to agree on many quarters. Okay, and the remaining coordinates, uh, he did some ad hoc argument, and that's how. He got me. Okay, so I'm not using the board very well. Mm. Okay, so this is the Fredman most thing, so let me erase this. So from the choosing, so here when it came to choosing X and X prime, he didn't use anything else about it being the score code. In yes. this procedure, did he use things about it being a four code or, or still just sort of So you mean Arikan? Yeah. Yeah. So Arikan used something in the four about the four code by basically saying you can pre process each coordinate so that the distribution is not very skewed. Because the point is, once you pick x and x prime on the coordinates, you agree, great, the graph is empty. But suppose you differ on a coordinate, say the you know tenth coordinate, then you would like to suppose you have values one and two, you would like to have not too many guys to have value three and four. So for that, he proved that you can assume that globally there is no skew in the uh, code in terms of coordinates. Okay, so so we basically combine both of these things. So again, let me just write that down. So Arikan 
had two ingredients pick x x prime to agree on many coordinates okay, some ad hoc argument when x l is actually different from x okay, in the lth coordinate they are different he used a different argument to bound the number of non isolated So, so in the last five minutes, let me at least tell you what we do, what's our strategy, I won't analyze it. So our strategy, somehow we combine both these ideas. On the one hand, we pick x and x prime randomly, but they won't be chosen uniformly at randomly. They will be chosen in a careful way, and I'll tell you what that way is, where they agree on a lot of coordinates. But then for the remaining coordinates, rather than pick a fixed x and x prime which agree on those coordinates and working with that, we will actually work over random x and x prime. So for the remaining second part, instead of an ad hoc argument, we can use a more um, robust argument. Okay, so at least, so again, the key thing in any argument is how do you pick x and x prime? Once you pick x and x prime, it's Hansel, and you have to do the analysis. The way we pick x and x prime is as follows. Pick, pick x uniformly at random from c. x prime, again you should do it without replacement and all that, but let's just say, we'll ignore those technicalities, uh, here pick x prime uniformly at random from all those code words from the set c in c, where the prefix c1 through to s equals x1 through to s. Again, what do I do? X is a completely random string in the code word. Okay, X is a completely random code word. Then I will go to the subcode where I'll pick some parameter S carefully. And this is picked in very similar way to Arikan's proof. And I'll pick X prime to completely match X here. Subject to that, it's random. Okay, so it's a choice case. No, I don't even permute In fact, it's actually the fixed prefix. But actually, what you touch upon raises, you know, is, is actually a point where we feel like we should be able to do better than our argument. And for those who, you know, might know the buzzword, what, what we are doing here in coding theory is Arikan used the Plotkin bound. And we are in some sense getting into the guts of the proof of the Plotkin bound and being more uh, careful about it. But there are other more sophisticated bounds, uh, which you can plug into Arikan's thing and you'll get an improvement. But we are not able to plug in those bounds into our strategy. It's at least so. We suddenly tried a uh, reasonable amount. Okay, so this is a strategy. So at least I have told you our strategy. Now I'll just say what the, the key technical thing, which is about half a page, uh, is done to finish the proof. But the L now, you can't pick it random, right? L now is before you did, since it didn't matter. Yeah. Now all L's were uni uniform. Was uniform. Now, yeah. now it's not true. Right? So let's write, yeah, exactly. So let's write it down. Tau xx prime. Again, let me do capitals because these are random variables, let's say. So this is certainly zero for L going from one, two to S, the first S coordinates, okay? And again, this S should be picked carefully, so which is related to the rate of the code, but let's not get into that. Now for the remaining things, what you can say, so we'd like to understand what this expectation is. And really it's, it's exactly the same. So what we are going to do is we are going to use this particular expression now. Okay. But when we use this particular expression, earlier everything was uniform. X was uniform, X prime was uniform. And in the remaining graph, you were asking for a random vertex, what is the probability? It was not isolated. But now X and X prime are correlated. Okay, and then Y is uniform from the rest of the code still. Because I still want to know what is the probability a vertex is non-isolated. Okay, so I'll just say this and then we'll be done. So it turns out, you just have to uh, say, so what is this thing going to be? Again, just expression for any coordinate for L more than S. So this is again, you can write it down exactly. Where F, so I'll say what this W means in a second. Uh, okay, so let's, uh, 
Okay, let me define two things here. So it's going to be summation f a Yes, it is the only change, but I need to tell what this f is. So f is the frequency. f is frequency vector of c in uh, lth coordinate. So that's exactly as that is, because you can really go to a per coordinate. Okay, it doesn't really matter the different coordinates. And then f w is the same thing, but not in the code c, but in the code which agrees with what x and x prime have in this. So fw is the same thing in the subcode cw, where c sub the first part equals some random variable. OK? So again, this is a little bit at the end and a bit I'm not saying it very in much detail. But somehow this is so basically there are two kinds of things going on. So because for x you are picking x and x prime come from another way to think about this is the following: you can pick a random prefix okay, for the first s coordinate. Let's call that w. That's a random variable, which is what's the value in the first s coordinate. You pick x and x prime at random from the code, subject to them agreeing with w on the first s coordinate. And therefore, for the purposes of x and y differing, these frequency rather than being the global code become frequencies from the subcode, where the prefix agrees with them. But for the rest of the code, it remains the same thing. Because once x and x prime have values a and b, you would like the non-isolated vertex to have a value different from a and b, and that happens with this okay? So this is all which happens. And then the last part, to finish the proof, we basically prove a convexity claim. So let me call this function phi of f, w, and f. And we basically prove a concavity, which is a calculation that expectation of phi of f w comma f is at most phi f f. And this is that's because expectation of the frequency vector over a random w is exactly the global frequency vector, as you will imagine. So this quantity is at most this, which is at most three. So again, long story short, what we are able to do is that the first L coordinates we are able to zero out tau. In the last n minus L coordinates, we are basically exactly able to do what Redman Comroche did and show its three. So in some sense, we get the benefit of Arikan, where a good chunk of coordinates tau becomes zero. And we also get the benefit of Redman Comroche, where every coordinate is never more than three. Okay, whereas Arikan was doing a different argument here, so this bound he got was. And of course, I didn't tell you where the 6 19th comes from. Um, so maybe I'll just say that and then finish. So basically, the, the point is you should pick s to be about n times 1 minus r0 by 2. No, sorry. Uh, n times. So, so if the r0 is the rate upper bound you're shooting for, so this is roughly the, the number of coordinates you should basically pick for the prefix. And then the bound you'll basically get is n r0 by 2. Uh, sorry, this one should be at most. So when you do the Hansel and everything, you end up getting something like this. So, three eights times. so you get 3 eighths times n minus s. And this is, of course, log 3. So you balance all this out, you get r0 by 2. So that's just the okay. okay, so let's. I don't know. Those are good questions. Yeah. So, so it's related to some questions like that. The so. chromatic number argument doesn't work for fractional one, or the bipolar. Oh, because the fractional thing is. Yeah, because you can definitely fractional power. Yeah. Uh, whatever, two bipolar. Two bipolar. Okay. So, so I guess yeah, maybe that's a good point. Somehow Hansel is inherently a non-convex type of argument. Yeah. Yeah. 
for other values, like let's say not for four, but like for five or for general k, like why those arguments will not work? Like let's say we separate not x, x and x prime, but like three arguments and yeah. we try to repeat the same. No, no, so that's exactly how the proof goes. So this fact, this bound I gave you, k factor will be k to the k oh, minus one. It is, it is. It's exactly proved this way, where you will pick k minus two guys at random, and then you talk about a graph. But you can also imagine doing other things. Once you go to five, you can imagine picking two things and talking about covering a uh, three uniform hypergraph. And there's a hypergraph version of Hansel, and then you balance everything, and you do the best split. And that's what uh, Corner Martin did. So they said you don't have to always go to a graph. You can pick a fewer number of x and x primes, and or x1, x2, x3, whatever, and then you'll get a hypergraph and use that. Yeah, but, uh, but, but it's a good question to try to incorporate those apply our tools to those methods as well, so which might give some improvement, probably only modest. So yeah. At this point, this is a, a lower bound, right? I'm, yeah. I'm building these. Does this give you any ideas how you could improve enough to generate these? Um, yeah, so those basically go back to coding problems. These are certain kinds of error correcting codes. So we have some tools there, but essentially we, the best, some component is going to be picked randomly, and then you can do some other clever things, but we don't have any good ideas to come close to these upper bounds. Or these upper bounds being lower bounds, so negative results. So. Thank you.